Making the argument that Unitarians assume their position really gets us nowhere. It poisons the well of discussion. The voice that you just heard was that of Mr. Andrew Corbin Laura, a fine, distinguished gentleman of the Jehovah Witness faith. While I do agree with Mr. Laura that assuming the other's position does tend to poison the well of discussion, we need to remember that he comes from a religious tradition that is known for assuming Unitarianism to begin with. In the Watchtower publication, Should You Believe in the Trinity, under What About Trinity Proof Text, it says this, It is said that some Bible texts offer proof in support of the Trinity. However, when reading such texts, we should keep in mind that the biblical and historical evidence does not support the Trinity. In other words, when we go into the Bible to study the nature of God, we should have the mentality that the biblical and historical evidence already does not support the Trinity. Should this really be the attitude of the Bible student? The Bible clearly teaches us what the nature of the Bible student should be. In Psalm 1 verses 1 and 2 it says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. So the nature of the Bible student is, because he delights in the word of the Lord, and because he meditates on it day and night, that is the fruit that shows that he is not interested in what any confession, creed, or religious organization has to say. He is simply interested in what the Word of God has to say. Now please do not misunderstand me. There is nothing wrong with creeds, confessions, or religious organizations. But when those same creeds, confessions, and religious organizations are put on a level equal to the Bible, that's where you see the danger. Why don't we raise the level of discussion? And we can do this by looking at the evidence each side presents. I'm willing to do that. I'm willing to look at your evidence if you're willing to look at mine. I'm not interested in pointing fingers. I'm not interested in saying that you assume your arguments because that gets us nowhere. My evidence, my level of foundation as a Christian comes from the Bible. When I became a Christian, I read starting from the book of Genesis, and I read the Hebrew Bible, and then I got to the New Testament. The Hebrew Bible gave me a level of foundation of who the nature of God was. My testimony would be very similar to that of Mr. Laura. When I first began reading the Bible, I started with the book of Genesis. In fact, I remember being bored out of my mind in church as a kid, reading the book of Genesis. However, now we are not discussing about reading the Bible. We are now talking about studying and interpreting the Bible, something that we call hermeneutics. Basically, hermeneutics is the science of interpreting the Bible and properly exegeting the text. Mr. Laura explains his method of interpreting the text. So, when I look back, and when I look at the early Jews, and the hundreds of years that they had with their God, and when I meditate on the fact that Jesus himself was Jewish, and the apostles were Jewish, I start with Judaism as a foundation for my faith, Mr. Laura further qualifies this in a question that he asked in his debate with Pastor Gene Cook on October 5th, 2005. Is early Christianity, notice the qualifier early, referring to first century Christianity, is that based upon early Judaism? To answer that question directly, I would have to say no. Early Christianity was based on the teachings of Jesus Christ, hence the name of the religion, 
Christianity. The Lord Jesus Christ himself tells us that he is the foundation of our faith, not Judaism. With reference to the believer, he says, He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood rose, the stream beat vehemently against that house and could not shake it, for it was founded on the rock. The Apostle Paul furthers this in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11, For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. In fact, the Bible also tells us that the apostles are the foundation of our faith. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 through 21, Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. And in Revelation 21, 14, Now the wall of the city, and it's speaking of the New Jerusalem, which is a picture of the believers, had twelve foundations, and on them, these twelve foundations, were the name of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. So, as a Christian, our foundation is not Judaism, but the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ and his apostles. Therefore, one of the rules of hermeneutics and interpreting the Bible is that we always interpret the Old Testament in light of what has been taught by us by the Lord Jesus Christ and his apostles in the New Testament, never the reverse. Um, did the first century Jews living at the time of Jesus in Palestine believe in a triune God? Thomas did, John did, Peter did. <laughs> They believed in a triune God? Absolutely. Did, did Jesus? Did Jesus? Believe in a triune God? Of course. And where does he talk about this trinity? Usually, when Unitarians ask this question, they're looking for the word trinity in the Bible. Not to impute this on Mr. Laura. However, I will be the first to admit that the word Trinity is a non-biblical word, but it is not an unbiblical concept. Yes, the Lord Jesus Christ did teach us the doctrine of the Trinity. In the Gospel of John, chapter 15, verse 26, the Lord Jesus Christ tells us, But when the Helper comes, that's the Holy Spirit, whom I, that's the Son, shall send to you from the Father, that's the Father, the Spirit of Truth, that's the Spirit, who proceeds from the Father, that's the Father, He, that's the Holy Spirit, will testify of me, and that's the Son. So here, in this one scripture, we see three distinct persons. In John chapter 14, verses 16 through 17, we have John recording the Lord Jesus Christ as saying, And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. Now who is this helper? Verse 17 tells us, The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. So again, we have Trinitarian language. We also see Trinitarian language in the benedictions of St. Paul. 2 Corinthians 13.14 records the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Finally, Miss Delora asks the question, If the Jews did not believe in a triune God, why would I believe in one? Why would the early apostles believe in one? Unless they had clear evidence to prove otherwise. Because our foundation, the Lord Jesus Christ, and his apostles who interpret the Old Testament for us 
taught us this truth. So, Mr. Laura, I leave you with the ironic benediction given to us in Numbers 6, 24 through 26. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, the one true eternal God, now and forever. Amen.